So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Nitin Sethi. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the New York State Athletic Commission. I want, you to, want to welcome you to the Medical Advisory Board meeting uh, of the New York State Athletic Commission. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Medical Advisory Board. And before we start, we'll just go across the room. Everybody can introduce themselves. Uh, why don't we start from here? Hi, Ryan Sackis, counsel to the New York State Athletic Commission. Good evening, Tony Giardina, interim executive director of the commission. Jim Kindernack, board member. Andika Nair, board member. Angela Gagliardi, assistant chief medical officer. Uh, Baruch Bendor from InfraScan. And we have Kim on uh, Kim. Hi, you... guys. Uh, Kim Subler, I'm the mixed martial arts program coordinator. And we have Dr. Metchler. He's uh, he's joined us on, joined us on Skype. And Buffalo, New York. Buffalo, New York. And in Albany, we have Hamish Kerr, board member. Max Alley, board member. Great. So we have a quorum with the five MAB members in attendance. We also expect in Dr. Jamie Noble. He's stuck in traffic, but he should be here shortly. So without further ado, I'd like to. Uh, start the meeting, and the second item on our agenda is to review and accept the minutes of the MEB meeting of the 16th of February 2017. Uh, I hope you all had a chance to review the minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved. So moved by Dr. Tinder. Is there a second? Great. So all in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. Aye. Okay. <laughs> Hi, so the minutes of the MEB meeting of the 16th of February are approved. Hi, so the next item, which is the main item on the agenda, is we want to review our medical manual with the MEB members. And basically, the medical manual has been updated to reflect the current uh, you know, procedures in place. Uh, I had actually gone over the medical manual last time, but we didn't have a quorum, so I'll briefly go over it again quickly. I hope you all have the medical manual in front of you. So, really, a few changes have been made. I'd like to bring your attention to page number, uh, part one, page three. And this has already been approved. You know, the, our, our blood testing policy is now that we'll just have CBC with platelet count, which must be completed once prior to the date of licensing. So, just to recall that we are not asking for PT, PDT, INR anymore. We just have CBC with platelet count. Uh, if you go further... Uh, on page four, which is testing of the eyes, we've added one more couple of points. Combatants who've had LASIK surgery when a lens flap has been created are not permitted to compete. And combatants who have red-green color blindness can compete after obtaining medical clearance to fight from an ophthalmologist. Further down in the same page, uh, 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 we basically documented a high-risk combatant's policy. This has already been reviewed by the Medical Advisory Board, has already been approved by the Medical Advisory Board. So basically, if you look, it's kind of the same thing which we approved. Uh, a high-risk combatant is defined as one who is 40 years and older, six consecutive losses in any manner, three consecutive losses by TKO or KO, one year of inactivity after start of the professional career, and 10 losses or more as a professional combatant. And basically what we are saying is that any combatant who falls into any one of these categories, additional testing will be done to assess the cardiovascular and neurological fitness to fight. And this may include... This may include uh, uh, MRI of the brain, and uh, in accordance to what Dr. Mechler and Dr. Noble told me, we'll have susceptibility-weighted imaging and gradio, uh, gradient echo imaging, we may request an MRA of the brain, a neurological evaluation by a neurologist, so a neuro clearance, and a formal neurocognitive evaluation by uh, either a formal uh, paper and pen neuropsychological evaluation or a com computerized testing such as the impact test. And further, a cardiac evaluation by a primary care physician or internist with referral to a cardiologist if needed, and additional blood workup if required. So that's just additional testing which is required for a high-risk combatant. Further down, if you go into our urine testing, we have just made it more thorough. We have documented everything. We have, we have kind of mentioned the fact that the use of illicit substance and performance-enhancing drugs is a, 
grave danger to the integ integrity of the sports. And on the next page, we have documented our current policy and procedures. Uh, and if you quickly read through that, it basically says two main points. We don't have a therapeutic uh, use exemption for, uh, for testosterone replacement therapy. Uh, and, and one more point which we say is the use of intravenous fluids for hydration prior to the event is not allowed unless the combatant has provided notice to the commission and has received uh, written approval. We have had a problem where some people have used IV uh, hydration after the uh, pre-fight weigh-in. So we basically documented the fact that IV hydration fluid is, uh, IV hydration therapy is not allowed unless there's a medical reason for that and they have to have prior approval from the commission. And the um, rest of the things are kind of uh, pretty much the same. At present, uh, the, the commission only tests pre- and post-fight urine samples, which is in accordance with the major athletic commissions. All fighters undergo a pre-bout urine testing. Post-bout urine testing is done in a random fashion. Either we order a standard panel, which basically checks for non-performance enhancing drugs, or a comprehensive panel is ordered which checks for both performance drugs and non-performance enhancing drugs. For telewise main fights or co-main fights or events with 10 rounds or more, both pre- and post-bout testing is done. So we just highlighted that in, in, the, uh, in the policy. Can I just um, make a note, doctor, that the commission always reserves the right to do testing at any time. And by example, the commission did out of competition testing for two fighters in the uh, event that just was completed last weekend. Right. And we tested them in their home states and country um, mm -hmm. and uh, had those results uh, before the event. So if you go on further, uh, we basically have a chart now made there which kind of basically summarizes everything in a, in a tabulated form about medical eligibility for licensure. It kind of basically says the same thing. We have the, our MRI requirements. Actually, we are one of the only commissions which actually have an MRI requirement that we actually document that we have to have a 1.5 Tesla MRI or a 3 Tesla MRI and all these different uh, sequences should be obtained. And then obviously EKG and eye exam, our uh, blood testing policy, that is the serologies and the CBC platelet count, the urine testing, and physical. So that's just a, a chart so that it's easier for, uh, you know, fighters and promoters to look at a medical manual on the, on the website and kind of just uh, become familiar with our policies. On the next page, which is page 8, uh, we have just summarized our medical team procedure on fight day. Just to make you aware that usually on, a, on, a, on any fight, we have about five to seven ringside physician attendants. That includes uh, me and Angela. So we have the CMO, the ACMO, and about three to five ringside physicians for every fight. Uh, in addition, obviously, to the medical team, we have an EMS team with an ambulance present at the venue. The medical team performs, as you know, a full physical evaluation at the time of the weigh-in. That includes a journal physical examination and a neurological examination. And a more abridged physical examination is performed on the, on the fight day itself. That's the pre-fight physical. And uh, we have a couple of things which we are doing right, right now. In between each round, whether it's in boxing or in MMA, the ringside physician is actually stepping up to the canvas, if it's boxing, or stepping into the cage physically to have a look at the fighter. They're usually standing behind. Uh, and just observing the fighter. They are not interfering with the corner time. Uh, and so that's been done just so that, so the fact that we are assessing the fighters at, between each round rather than only when a medical emergency arises. Um, we have two ways we can do a timeout. So uh, let's assume there's a concern raised for traumatic brain injury or some, we have some, some, some concern is raised for a fighter. So the ringside physician can step up to the ring canvas and basically call a timeout. What happens in that case is, in boxing, the, the referee will stop the fight, and he'll walk over the injured fighter to the ringside physician. The other fighter will be, will be uh, sent to the neutral corner. And that time, the ringside physician can quickly assess the fighter. Now, obviously, 
uh, we have to do this uh, carefully because if you do too many of timeouts, you you give an advantage to the fighter who's uh, actually you give an advantage to the fighter who's losing because you give him time to recover. So uh, the assessment is very quick. Five to ten seconds, a quick neuro exam, and and a decision is made, and the referees uh, inform whether the fight is going to continue or should the fight be stopped. So that's one timeout which has been done for predominantly for concern for traumatic brain injury. A second timeout which can be done is for laceration. So let's assume a fight is going on, and suddenly there's a big laceration from a headbutt. The referee can call a timeout in the middle of a round and bring the fighter over to the ringside physician on that corner. And the ringside physician had been instructed to quickly assess the cut. Uh, and the whole idea is to see if the, the vision, vision is not obstructed, can the fighter continue, and then it's either a go or a no-go decision to, uh, to the referee. So that timeout which has been done is basically been done uh, uh, to protect the fighters. Then obviously after the fight is over, all fighters are examined by the ringside physicians and just to let you know we have done uh, we have done and this we already run past the MAB and approved it we have done a couple of red flags and we've been using the red flags and I want to give you a feedback that a red flag has been really helpful so in our last fight in the Bellator fight we had a fighter who after the fight was over the post fight urine had blood in it a red flag was issued because he had blood in the urine the fighter was asked to, but the fighter was clinically stable, no complaints. So once a red flag is issued, the fighter was uh, uh, was observed in the commission room. Uh, inspector stayed with the fighter throughout. The fighter was instructed to hydrate himself aggressively. He hydrated himself aggressively. The second urine was actually clear, and he was fine, and he was discharged. So the red flag is issued to basically observe the fighter who's 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 stable. The other time you're using a red flag is when a concern for a TBI is raised. And these are fighters who come out of the ring or the cage. They are neurologically stable. They don't have any complaints. But it has been a tough fight with a lot of, lot of head shots. So we don't want to just have a quick look at them and if they're stable, discharge them. We, we issue a red flag. And again, the fighter is observed for 10 to 15 minutes. If the fighter remains stable, the fighter is discharged home. If there's any change in the fighter's status, any complaints, headache, anything like that, he's sent to the ER for HCT. So we've been using the red flag. Uh, you, uh, I, thank, I thank you for approving the red flag policy. It's been really helpful. We have used it, and it's working really well. Uh, let's go on further. I'll, I'll keep it short. So can I, if you can go... I one thing, uh, hey, just to clarify, it says that there's an ambulance at the scene. You actually, do we actually have two? So if we, one ambulance has to take someone out, then the other bouts go on because there's the backup there? That's right. The, it, there has to be a minimum of one ambulance. But in most of the venues, we have two. In Like in Madison Square Garden, whenever when one ambulance left the left the venue, the other ambulance was there. A fight will not go on, or a, or a fight will be stopped if the ambulance is not there on the scene. And we'll wait for the ambulance to come back. Very good. Okay. So, yes. Just a clarification on the uh, high-risk combatants in the magnetic resonance imaging of the brain or susceptibility with imaging and radio echo, it should say not and, but or. You got it. Do both. I understand. I understand. So it would be or, not and. I got it. Thank you. We'll make that changes. Uh, if I may proceed further, in part two, basically, nothing, nothing is different. It just lists the banned substances, including the non-performance enhancing drugs and the performance enhancing drugs. Uh, and like I said, further thing, we have highlighted that we don't have a therapeutic use exemption, and we have highlighted our, the use of intravenous fluids is prohibited. If you go further on page 11, we have really clarified our policy with respect to the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, that they should not be taken within one week of the uh, combative sport event. And... Um, you know, if, un if unsure whether painkiller is a non is an NSAID, the combatants advised to contact the New York State Athletic Commission prior to taking the drug. 
Uh, with, I want to bring your attention to braces because that's where some changes have occurred. Now that we have uh, MMA, so we've added the uh, policy with respect to braces in MMA. So combatants are, uh, are, permit, are permitted to wear a knee or an ankle sleeve uh, during the bout for the following conditions. And that has been highlighted. Uh, and elbow sleeves are not allowed in MMA. And basically, we have documented that in order for the commission to evaluate an elbow sleeve or an, an, sorry, an ankle sleeve, uh, the combatant should present that to this uh, should uh, present that to the commission in a timely fashion, so we can have a look at the uh, uh, these braces and approve them. Yes, please. I didn't understand what number three meant for either of that. The combatant without the knee sleeve is found medically fit. So you're saying the opponent, or I didn't understand what that meant. Uh, so combatants are permitted to wear a knee or an ankle sleeve during a bout under the following conditions. Uh, so basically, that the fact is that without the sleeve, the combatant should be medically clear. Otherwise, yeah, no, right. yeah, it's Aside the sleeve is yeah, yeah. So he should be still line. clear without the. With, yeah. You know, like aside from the need for the sleeve, they're otherwise medically. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, I read that's it. The point, yeah. That's the point. Yeah. That's the point. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, we can we can make that. Clear. Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't know when you sleeve. said that if you yeah. had the opponent. You know what I mean? It yeah. Make yeah. Make yeah. Sense. The way you said it sounds good. Aside from the need for the sleeve, exactly. we can change that a little bit. Now, I, I just want to bring your attention to the breast implant policy. This we discussed. Hey, Jamie. Hello. Uh, this we discussed last time, and uh, we didn't have a quorum, but we got some very good uh, uh, suggestions. So this whole thing <coughs> arose because when we had the MMA event in Buffalo, we had a fighter who had a breast implant. And we really, as of now, uh, our, our medical manual says that uh, combatants with breast implant are not permitted to box. So we looked at this, uh, uh, how, uh, you know, we reviewed the medical literature, how, uh, exactly what is the risk of breast implants rupturing during a, a fight. And what we really found was that breast implants can rupture. If you really do a pub, PubMed search, you'll find some articles where breast implants have ruptured during a mammogram or, you know, accident. But really the risk of rupture is, especially the silicon implants, is very, very low. And even if it ruptures, there's no immediate medical concern which is raised. So, for example, if you have breast implants and you feel suddenly they're ruptured, usually what will happen is you will make an appointment and go and see your surgeon, and the surgeon will have to do an MRI to figure out if it's ruptured or not. So the policy was amended, and it's pending approval by the MAB. And what it basically says, I'll read it from here. Due to concern over rupture, a combatant with breast implants must submit a medical clearance to fight, a no-objection letter from the, from the treating surgeon. The medical clearance letter should include the date of the surgery, the type of the implant, whether it's saline, whether it's liquid silicon or silicon gel, the number of times the combatant has previously competed with the breast implants, and any prior history of rupture of the breast implant, whether in or out of competition. And after review of the above information, an appropriate medical decision will be exercised by the commission to determine if the combatant can, can compete. And if a rupture is suspected during the fight or post-fight, the combatant is going to be advised to follow up with a plastic surgeon as soon as possible. And uh, just to inform you, there are a lot of uh, combatants in MMA who have breast implants. So we do have to have a policy. It's, it's becoming increasingly common. We spoke to other commissions. Uh, California approves uh, breast implants, so does Nevada. So I hope you are in agreement with, uh, with this breast implant policy. And apart from that, all right, there a, uh, if you go to... Is there, is there a, um, an importance of how many times they fought? So if they have just gotten this breast implant and have not fought, is that anyone diff any how different than someone who's had 10 bouts? Yeah, I think, I think what we are really doing is trying to get some information, as much information as possible, and if they've fought a couple of times with the breast implants, that's probably like, I guess, a good sign that, you know, they've already been to a fight. And the whole idea is then you make a, 
case by case decision of, all, of whether allowing them to fight or saying that you know what it's not safe. But as much as I reviewed this, it's not, uh, rare. It's not rare that it's. I don't know if that's of, of any importance. So if they've never fought with them, are you going to say no? You can't fight. Uh, no, it's just going to be one of the things which we take into consideration in determining the uh, fitness to fight. I think it's a good idea to have the surgeon uh, sign off on saying that he thinks that they're okay. Right, there right. Been something specific about the difficulty of the case or revision right. or something. Where, but I think that beyond that, if the patient... If the, if Batten is willing to accept the risk and the surgeon is signed off, I think that's about it. And they would automatically pass over and say yes, mm -hmm. personally. I, I have a little reluctance in asking a surgeon who may not be involved in the decision for the fitness of fight to determine whether or not a patient is fit to fight with these. Right? I mean, somebody may have had breast implant surgery done 20 years ago, and that physician's being asked to provide some input. I think we have to come up with a policy yeah. rather than a case-by-case -case basis. Well, you know, so what happened when, when uh, to give you more practical, what happened in Buffalo was that this kind of was, was just came up on us suddenly and we really were caught there. I remember because, we talked about it right. last, last week. So that time we called the surgeon and apparently the surgeons said, I've done so many breast implants and my experience of breast implant will never rupture. Don't worry about this thing. So we kind of got it seems that these implants are pretty durable. That's an endowment. I did a PubMed search. There are case reports of implants rupturing in all sorts of circumstances, even when you're doing like a, a mammogram because you're squeezing the breast. So this is the best way I could come up. You could come up with it kind of gives us some leverage of, uh, of allowing these fighters to compete. I think the, the biggest risk I found was that when a saline implant ruptures, uh, there's a sudden change in the breast shape. So immediately you come to know that the implant is ruptured. When you have a silicone gel and it ruptures, you really, there's no change in the breast shape. You really, you, to, to actually diagnose that the implant is ruptured, you actually have to do an MRI. You can't physically diagnose it because there's no change in the breast shape. I mean, I think, I think the reason this probably is on our minds is just because of the, you know, and we talked about this last time about the lawsuits that came about with the liquid silicon implants, right. which are not in use anymore. With, with the, you know, there was this lupus-like syndrome that came about with these. Um, those, those haven't been in use for, I think, 20 years or so now. The likelihood you're going to have a combatant who had a, one of those breast implants actually in the ring seems right. extraordinarily low. I mean, it, it almost seems like, you know, I mean, my concern about asking for a letter like this is, you know, it, and we've talked about where do you draw the line with how many policies you have to have, right? Do you have to have, I mean, somebody had, you know, minor surgery of any kind, are you going to have to seek out a, a, a clearance letter? And is that person who is writing a, a medical clearance letter, are they as knowledgeable about the topic as, as we may be? Or, or, you know. Well, I, I think the, the one advantage of a medical clearance letter will be that the surgeon at least will be able to tell us what kind of implant it is. Is it silicon? Is it saline? When was it implanted? It seems that the longer the implant has been there, the more is the chance of rupture. Newer, newer implant ruptures less as compared to implants that have been there for like 10 years. Well, so is it a clearance letter or an informational letter? It's, it's a type of a no objection letter, kind of a medical clearance letter. Ultimately, though, we say case by case because it's our decision. Right. Like, we could take that letter and put it, uh, you know, in light of all the other medical information regarding right. that combatant and then, you know, look at the full picture and make... And it, it's well, some, can, can you can you come up with an example of why somebody would be excluded from fighting because of a breast implant? That's my point. Is is, is this even necessary? Well, what would be a case scenario where it would be? Because as the as the and that's the right point. But as the medical manual stands right now on the commission website, it says boxers with breast implants are not permitted to fight. This policy was laid down probably a few many years before, and I don't know. It was never updated. So we need to have an updated policy because breast implants are becoming common and fighters are entering the ring with breast implants. I, I can think of an example that the surgeon actually um, gave to me that sometimes you have fighters who want excessively large breast implants. 
So in that case, they may say that the risk of rupture for this particular type or size of implant relative to the person's size is more likely to rupture with repeated impacts. And that, that, you know, that might be a case where it wouldn't be. Well, then maybe it's important to put something in, you know, what's the whole point of having this? I mean, what, who are your high-risk profile fighters to begin with? Because if this, this is a policy that's going to be read by the fighters themselves, they might want to know, well, why are you even asking about this in the first place? So if there's some, maybe we should just add a clause, something about, there's some suggestion that disproportionately large cosmetic breast implants may be at higher risk for rupture relative to body size. I don't know. Wait, I, I don't have evidence uh, Yeah, I don't think so. We, we can back up that. Yeah. that uh, well, the, um, to, well, to that point, is there any evidence of based medicine that for why we even have this in the first place other than the fact that we had a policy in the past which I have to presume was because of this the liquid silicon gel right. breast implants mm -hmm. and not because that the modern breast implants actually posed a risk right and all we are changing is that instead of saying breast implants are permitted which we could I guess we can completely just have one sentence saying breast implants are permitted just exercising a little bit more concern that let's get some information, let's get a letter from the surgeon, find out what implant it is, when it was placed, and then majority of these fighters will, will likely be approved. I guess it gives us a chance if there is some element of surprise, because, you know, we, we never know what we're going to get. If something might be peculiar. Well, would, an, well, would an alternative be that the, the ringside or the, the treating physician or the, the clearing physician has the right to request that a letter of um, a, a letter of you know uh, capability to fight can be solicited from the breast surgeon rather than having to have an a priori stance of saying that everybody that with a breast implant has so to So if it's okay with you, can I can we change the wording by this due to concern or rupture combating with breast implant instead of saying must submit, can we say maybe asked to submit? I think that would be fine. My, my concern is as if somebody who gets asked to write these le to letters all the time about neurological clearance for one thing or another, there's no such thing. You know, it's, it's more that people feel better about themselves, but there's really no value in some of the letters that I write. And I just don't want to waste somebody's time is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Guys, can I add something here? And it's just food for thought. I, I certainly don't disagree, but, uh, you know, you, you may have mentioned that the, the physician that's actually clearing that fighter should have the option to ask for a letter. I think there's a time element here that that's going to make that almost impossible. We examine that for that for the first time the day before the fight. And I, you know, it's usually on a Friday. And I, I think that if we put that in there, you know, I, I just want to be cautious about that because I don't, I don't want to get into situations where we're scrambling last minute and that fighter who should be concentrating on the fight and rehydrating themselves is scrambling last minute try to get a hold of a surgeon who may or may not be working on a Friday. Good point. Yeah, and that's a good point. To have it up front, it makes the file complete. Yep. And we can refer to it if, if it's deemed necessary. The other, the other thing I would say is that would it be reasonable to have the patient, you know, the, I'm sorry, the, the fighter actually just sign sort of like a sign something saying that they know that they're doing this, that they could rupture and they're willing to take the risk. Because, you know, the question I think is you're saying is that if it ruptures, is it really detrimental? Is it going to hurt them? Like if saline ruptures, you know, it's in the space, but it's not going to hurt them. And, and again, silicone, I don't know, you know, I mean, long term, but if the, say that the, you know, the, say that it's hard to figure out exactly what type they have and, and you can't find somebody to do it, but, and then they say, you know, whatever, and, but the fighter still wants to fight and says, I still want to do it. You know Isn't I mean? there They're a waiver in the, the application, risk? the license application? I mean, because there's a risk for bleeding right. in the brain. There's a risk for, you know, pneumothorax, uh, is death even. For, yeah. but, so, I mean, I think it in, encompasses all types of injuries. Is, is there a, a waiver in? We're just, have to look. The nature of competing, like getting a license to compete in combat sports. Here. I guess what I'm getting at is that, you know, it seems like we had a policy in place that may have been predicated on old data, mm -hmm. and we're trying to replace it with something that is, you know, maybe uh, gets past the problem we had before. But what I'm saying is, is this even necessary at all in the first place? It, it seems like busy work to some degree for all of us. I mean, seeking out a letter, trying to get a hold of a, you know, and maybe it'll be helped out if they know that this policy is in place in advance so that they get this letter in well, advance, especially for something like UFC. My, my only concern with that, uh, Jamie, is that 
breast implants do rupture. That's what I've figured out. It's and not pe- that they don't people rupture. People get concussed when they fight. Sure. Yeah, we, you know, so the question, as if, if you all have, as MAB advise me, uh, advise us that, you know what, it's just a simple statement, breast implants, fighters of breast implants uh, can fight. That's fine with me. This policy was put in because we wanted to have some sort of a protection and some sort of a due evaluation of their breast implants before we let them step into the cage. But what if we do have someone who comes from a, a, another country and they just happen to have an old type implant? I'm just saying, well, you know. Are those then, even manufactured any longer, though? I, I don't know. I'm you just... always have the right to um, look at the individual situation. Mm-hmm. So you could, you know, the doctor who's treating can say, I mean, the, the policy can be breast plant, the breast plants, uh, fighters of breast plants are, are permitted to fight subject to the, um, you know, the assessment or, or approval of the treating, of the ringside physician or the, 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 the physician who's examining them for the commission. Right, but like Kim said, they may not even know the details and they may need to get a hold of the performing surgeon. No, but and then... uh, yeah. what, what, if I'm getting Jamie right, what he's saying is that let them fight and unless you, unless you have any, any concern and at the time of the, when you are assessing them at the time of the pre-fight physical, that's basically a decision left to the ringside physician. I'm fine with... Uh, that is even much. What you are proposing is actually much more liberal policy than what we we have documented here. Or put the onus on the athlete to to you know acknowledge that there's a risk in everything that they do. Matt just yeah. pointed out in public our application, and there is sort of a waiver where they affirm that they they're aware of that. You can take a look of the risks overall right. risk to health and safety, and yeah. that's encompassing. In, Cal- yeah. in California, yeah. in so, California, so Nevada. Nevada. Yeah. Where they've been, Do we where need they've to been allowing this? Is it that they just let people? They just say that they can fight. I believe so. I don't. I believe. I believe they 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 just allow breast implants. That's it. I don't think so. They have a formal. I may be wrong. I can check check on that and get back to you. But I don't think so. They have a formal sort of a policy in place. Yeah, I would think yeah, that Nathan, you know they're, um, they're I facing. I talked to both Bob and Andy. Neither one of them have a breast implant policy. They're just. It's just not there. Um, they just allow the fighters to fight with them. It's, it's not a question for them. So I, uh, I'll go along, uh, go around the uh, room with the MAB members. Uh, I'm fine with I, either of the way that this is framed right now. If you just want to just say fighters with breast implants are allowed to fight, uh, that's fine with us also. That sounds reasonable to me, honestly. Like I think, I think what you would suggest is to say, unless you know, when they're being examined, that some issue that's brought up. That I think, I don't think there's a downside to it. You know. Nice. Well, the, the comment is. If, is there ever going to be an instance where you say where there's some information that makes you say somebody can't participate? If it looked infected or something, but other than that. They're facing much bigger risks than the ruptured implant. When they step in. and well, I, the repercussions of it are nothing. I mean, other than disfigurement. Yeah. But I mean, I I just think if if the answer is there's nothing that's ever going to come about a letter or any other bit of information, then why make it hard and just say they're they're it's just the simple approach they're allowed to participate. So let me give you a little bit of background into this. When we had this uh, thing came up in Buffalo, we had reporters reaching out to us and saying, well, according to your medical manual, boxers with breast implants cannot fight. But why are you allowing this MMA fighter to, to fight? Do you have a difference in breast implant policy between boxing and MMA? I mean, all these questions started, started coming out. You know, all reporters asked a lot of questions. And that time, we really did not have a... A really good answer. So we looked at the policy, and likely this policy was formulated, like you said, in the years past when these implants were prone to rupture. As much as we have checked right now, these implants are pretty durable. That's all. That's all we really found out. They uh, they do rupture. They have ruptured in the immediate post-operative setting. They have ruptured later on. And the rupture doesn't pose any seeming health. Yeah, that that much I was able to find out that there's no immediate threat to the safety of the. It's not like embolism or something like that happening. That that's not the case. 
the most important thing is that the silicon comes out and that needs to be attended to at some point in time. So in Albany, do you have any thoughts? Uh, you want to, uh, what are your suggestions, please? I, I think it's actually a waste of time, the ringside physician examining someone's breasts to decide if they, you know, should fight or not. I think that's a waste of time. It's not a health risk, and they should be concentrating on other things. So I think we should just adopt a policy where the fighters are acknowledging that there's a risk of their breast implant rupturing and be done with it. And I don't think there should be any further evaluation by the the um, position pre-fight. I don't think that's fair. Um, I mean, they're, they're, we've, we've tossed around all these circumstances. You can't make that call in the hours before the fight. You're not calling the surgeon. You're not, you know, I mean, I think we should just adopt the policy and say we, the, the athlete needs to acknowledge the risk and be done with it. That's it. I think keep it simple. Thank you. Dr. Meshler, do you have any comments? Yeah, I think it's I, I would allow uh, boxers to fight with breast implants. Uh, I think it's somewhat uh, archaic for us to think that these individuals are training for weeks to months and years with breast implants and then uh, going to a match and then we deny them the opportunity. So I would just allow the box and the fighter takes their own risk. It could be perceived in the media to be somewhat sexist of us not allow them to uh, uh, do what they do best, which is boxing. So um, I, I would rather let them just box. Yeah, uh, you raise a good point because in Buffalo, that really thing became big media thing where the fighter actually was upset because the media was talking more about her breast implants than, than her fight itself. And uh, so if you're okay with this, uh, can we frame it like this? Fighters with breast implants are allowed to fight the fighters need to acknowledge the risk of rupture of the implant during the fight. If a rupture is suspected, the combatant is advised to follow up with a plastic surgeon as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? And yeah. as soon as possible doesn't mean they have to stop the fight. No, no. They'll probably not even come to know that the implant is ruptured during the fight. Yeah, frankly, okay. it's, it's uh, All right, Thank you. Uh, we'll go forward and... I will come to page number 14. That's all the same. Nothing has changed. So in page 14, all we have done is we really just highlighted our suspensions and our policy. Uh, so the only difference is that nowadays all combatants after a fight get a mandatory administrative suspension for seven days. That's just given for them to rest. Uh, and for KOs and TKOs due to head blows, uh, Suspensions may range from a minimum of 30 days to a maximum of 90 days or more at the discretion of the supervising ringside physician. And the ringside physician may request clearance from a neurologist prior to return to competition. And for other injuries such as lacerations, orthopedic injuries, again, combatants may get suspensions ranging from a minimum of 30 days to a maximum of 90 days or more at the discretion of the supervising ringside physician. And then obviously, let's assume it's a orthopedic injury, the ringside physician may request medical clearance from an orthopedic uh, physician prior to return to competition. And all suspensions will remain in effect until medically cleared by the commission. And uh, if you go to next page, page 15, in ringside physicians, we have just kind of highlighted that all ringside physicians need to remain in CME compliance. Uh, they have to hold a valid and unrestricted New York State medical license. Uh, I think the CME policy has already been discussed by the MAB. And um, that is the only changes which have been made to the medical manual. So it's been updated. And I think the last, uh, the last manual was in 2014. So this is a manual updated after that. Are there any questions, concerns? The, how do you determine if somebody's lost more than 1% of their body weight? So let me go back where you have that. So they're just being weighed one time, correct? They, yeah, they've been weighed one time, though. Uh, that's, I'm glad you asked the question. We are in the process of implementing a pre-fight weigh-in. That means so they'll be weighed in at the time of the, uh, the, the media weigh-in, which is a day before the fight. That's the time they have to make the contracted weight. But we are, 
usually what happens, they, they make weight and then they hydrate. So now we are going to try to have a pre-fight vein. That's a vein right before the fight. And that's basically been done uh, because uh, concerns have been raised about the dehydration practices which a lot of these fighters employ. Uh, and obviously, you have fighters coming in who have gained like 30 pounds uh, as compared to like their, or 15, 20 pounds as compared to the, uh, the weight at the time of the pre-fight uh, physical. So we are in the process of doing that, and uh, uh, we are in the process of formulating that uh, policy, and uh, at the next MAB meeting, uh, we'll be presenting that to you. But let's say they gained, if they weighed 180 pounds and they gained 10 pounds back, then they inherently did lose more than 1%, and then they shouldn't be allowed to box by this You're right. rule. Uh, let me see the... It's the last page. Yeah, and 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 uh, so uh, if you look at what the IBF does, in in the IBF, uh, I was looking at this in IBF fights. If if a fighter gains more than ten pounds, which is four point five kgs, then what will happen is they let the fight go on, but the title is off the off the table. They're not fighting for a, a belt anymore. Obviously. This thing all becomes irrelevant in heavyweights. In heavyweights, they can go. There's no upper limit. They can they can go up to as many as they want to go up to. Right. Nitin, can I can I just say something about the one percent body weight? Yeah. Um, we need to be cautious when we say that um, if a fighter has gained more than one percent of their body weight on the day of the by the day of the fight, then they shouldn't be allowed to fight. But what we need to remember is that. What, what we say to the fighters when they do the official weigh in on the Friday, the 24 hours before the event, if it's a title fight, we allow them 1%, one more percent that they can lose in order to make the official weigh. So when we weigh them in the next day, you know, the 1% really doesn't play a part in it. Uh, say that again, please. Um, I think it was, was it Dr. Meckler who was talking about the 1%? Allie. No, not Ali. Okay, because okay, I, I can't, I'm sorry, guys, I can't see who that is. So I, I, there was a comment that said that, you know, if, if we weigh the fighter on the, on, on the day of the fight and the fighter weighs 180 pounds and he, and he gains 10 pounds, he's over that 1%. And so he shouldn't be allowed to fight. But that 1% only plays a role when... We have a title fighter who steps on the scale the day of the weigh-in. We only allow them from that first official weigh-in, we allow them two hours to, to lose an additional 1% in order to make that weight. So the 1% will not play a role on event day. Okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. I see. So uh, if you have no other questions, uh, Sorry, I came in late. There was only one thing I wanted to ask about, and that was um, yeah, I had emailed you about this boxer in Canada who had died during mm -hmm. an MMA fight. Did you guys talk about this already? No, we haven't. Okay. Um, well, the, the issue was, I don't know if you guys saw, but there was an MMA, a former uh, UFC, current MMA fighter um, who died in Canada a few weeks ago, and he actually did both boxing and MMA. Right. And I, I don't remember the exact record that he had, but he had lost the majority of the most recent fights. He would not have actually qualified, as far, far as I could tell from what was available online, he would not have necessarily qualified as a high-risk combatant with, it, with one exception. So he was under 40. He had not had six consecutive losses. He had had three consecutive losses, but not by either TKO or KO. That He had a decision in two of the others. And they were not all in one sport. Right. He had, however, had 10 or so losses as a professional combatant. But again, they weren't all in one sport. He'd only right. boxed, I think, four fights ever. Right. And the rest were in MMA. Um, so the, the key term here is professional combatant. Right. But maybe, I don't know if that's so clear to the ringside position. Would they think to ask, just to be sure, are, we're talking about both MMA and boxing. Yeah, I think you raise a good point. So the whole idea is that six losses can be in either sports, then you combine MMA and boxing. It's just not, it doesn't have to be just boxing or just MMA. I, I'm fine with that. I think that's, that's completely valid. 
That would be something that we look at before they get to the ringside position. That yeah, when you, when you determine a high-risk combatant. Yeah. But are, are athletes truthful about that kind of thing? Are they, are they, are they even cognizant to, to well, we can work out other things together? Yeah. 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 But on box rec, this fighter actually didn't come up. He only came no, up for boxing, we, we not go, MMA. We don't go by box rec, we go by fight Right, facts. well, there's, there's two different databases that you're talking about. Fight facts is, is behind a firewall. I, can't, I, I tried looking at it. I, I, I don't think I can get into that. So, no, you wouldn't, but if he's going to be fighting... In New York, we require the fight facts report. And that includes MMA and boxing? No, just boxing. We have access to the ABC database, which is for MMA, and we can see any suspensions, records, anything like that, if he's an MMA fighter. Yeah. So I mean, I the way I found it was his yeah. Wikipedia page and then the uh, uh, box rec. That was uh, yeah, I, 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 No, I'm kidding. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think this is a valid point, and uh, I, I feel that it's a good point that the losses should include losses in either of the two sports. Well, you could say any professional sport. Any professional combat sport. Combat sport, right. Yeah. Because they shouldn't be professional kickboxing. They might like be competing in another state, even though we don't, like, we don't oversee it. And then one other strange thing I saw in the news, I don't know if this caught your attention, but there was an... Um, uh, an MMA fighter who the other day um, was very public about the fact that she had actually stooled during her right. fight. Right, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. She, so that apparently there was, I guess, stool in the ring right. uh, during yeah. her fight. Yeah. Um, and she was even tweeting about it. Um, you know, I mean, we have policies about, you know, uh, you know, diagnosing HIV and hepatitis and so forth. And clearly there's blood everywhere um, after these fights. Do we need to have any policy about you know cleanup or these kind of things, or, think, that, or is that you know I let, venue specific? I let Kim answer because Kim has had experience. She's already talked. Uh, apparently, Kim told me this is not unusual. It does happen in MMA where a fighter we might lose control of his bubbles. Uh, Kim, can you just tell us a little bit what's the policy for cleanup? Yeah. So um, absolutely, you know, we're looking at contamination, and and we have real concerns with that because you, you don't just look at HIV, you don't just look at hepatitis C or B. You know, as you all know, <clears throat> there's E. coli. There's there's so many other things that can happen as a result of that. Um, we require we require the promoters to have um, cleaners um, at cage side uh, who are required to go in between rounds and between bouts with it's a, a bleach and water solution or, um, you know, a, a disinfectant solution to clean up various parts of the floor that, uh, you know, it's noted that there are that are contaminated. I mean, I, from my own experience, I was at the garden fight last fall. That doesn't happen. There was a guy who had a, an eight-inch laceration on his scalp that ended the fight. There was blood everywhere. And two guys with rubber gloves and two white terry cloth towels came out and just pushed around a white terry cloth towel until it wasn't bringing up any new, new blood. I mean... You know, presumably there's not an infectious virus we have to worry about because these people have been screened. I think the bigger issue is if somebody stools on the ring and then somebody comes in who has a minor laceration, rubs their head on that, you know, there's a risk for, you know, some yeah, number of infections. I mean, there's, they're going to get skin, you know, staph infections. They're at risk for that, any kind of laceration. But, I mean, there's, I mean, there's just a level of, you know, frankly, grossness that's about this sport that I hadn't even thought about until I saw that. Now, I'll, I'll give you a personal example. I was working this fight, and I, I jumped in to see the fighter. It's a boxing fight, and he was, he was so excited. He, I was trying to examine him, so I was facing him, and he just spit it on me, and I got blood all over my face. My glasses prevented the blood from going into my eyes, but I got blood into my mouth. I could, I could taste his blood. So, in fact, I actually reached out to an ID specialist, and basically what he told me was, I said, you know, these fighters have been checked for but, you know, the serology is done a while ago. So he clearly told me, he said, if you get it on your intact mucous membrane, don't worry about it. But if you got into your mouth, you need prophylaxis. You got to go on uh, HIV prophylaxis. Even though these athletes have been screened, right? Well, they've been screened, but they're but not screened year. like, you know. It's a year. It's a yeah. year. So it uh, gave me a few restless nights. I mean, I decided whether I want to go on prophylaxis. or I decided not to go on prophylaxis, but... And that's, a, that's one thing I actually wanted to bring to the ringside physicians this thing because when you're really facing the fighter, they, they spit at you at times when they're getting the, uh, you know, they're, they're yeah. talk, when you're talking to them, are you okay? And he says, I, I'm fine, and you just spit on me. And you just get this, all this blood on your face. So, well, you, even, you even get it at ringside, and, it, and you know, it does fly. Yeah, it, yeah. it does fly. Spit, there's sweat, there's blood, there's so many things that happen. Can we, can we address... Uh, Dr. Noble's concern and 
maybe have uh, the ring sort of slightly decon decontaminated after like especially a bout which is very bloody I mean is that even possible I mean you've got a canvas that's soaking up blood it just didn't seem to me even practical to be able well, to address it when you're dealing I mean there were what 12 10 fights something like that in the first card well, as much as I know about HIV as soon as HIV comes out it, it, it pretty much dies it's the the more risk of is of hepatitis right, right. And HIV is not going to be viable but uh, hepatitis, certainly, you worry more about hepatitis. I mean, I actually feel that all these fighters should have be vaccinated for hepatitis B, but when they come in, they usually, if you look at the hepatitis B antibody, it's negative. So they are not vaccinated for hepatitis B. Hi, so uh, if everybody's okay with this, uh, yeah, may I have a move a motion to... Is there a motion to approve the revised medical manual? I would so move. I'll so I said again. Okay, great. So, uh, all those in favor of approving the manual? Aye. Great. So, uh, right. any, anybody opposed? Okay, so the medical manual is approved. And... Uh, the next item on our agenda is to review the application of panel physicians since uh, we are going to be discussing uh, private uh, personal information of these physicians. We, I move, uh, I, 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 I made a motion to go into executive session. As, um, is there a motion to do that? Yes. Second. Okay, so we'll go into executive session. Yeah, I'm going to put you guys on mute. But we have to get a phone call in here. Right. So, call or... well, Ryan is doing that. Okay. Uh, can you give us the What's number? Yeah. Or, it's 518-391-45. What, what's happening? No, uh, just call us. On, uh... Call us. On, uh, <laughs> yeah. on camera. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Um, do you want to text it to? Yeah. Us? Well, Matt, text did you take it down, Matt? I have it in the office. All right, then I'll just send it right now. Thank you. All right, I'm going to put guys yeah, on mute. Yeah, put us on mute. So we're still recording? Or we're not recording?
Camera. Hello. Can you see us in the heart oh, there? Go Albany. Yeah, we can see you. Can you see us? Yes. All right, great. Okay, Kim, you're still there? I'm still here. Okay. okay. So we are out of the executive session, and during the executive session, we reviewed uh, one new uh, ringside physicians and uh, 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 the went over the current panel physicians for reappointment. Uh, Dr. Gagliardi, can you read the names? Yes, the new approved ringside physician is Dr. Stephen Stoller, and the reappointed physicians are Dr. Amadori, Dr. Arroyo, Dr. Beatty, Dr. Bennett Brown, Dr. Everly, Dr. Galjuar, Dr. Kaplan, Dr. King, Dr. Lomas, Dr. Marabelli, Dr. Nash, Dr. Polovsky, Dr. Sabini, Dr. Sadler, Dr. Thumb, and Dr. Wright. Thank you. So we go to the last item on the agenda, and I'm glad all the MBME members are here. Uh, we want to review the infra scanner. Uh, just briefly tell you what the infra scanner is. An infra scanner is a handheld device which is using uh, near infrared technology. Uh, basically, uh, it's FDA approved and it's it's been used to detect. Uh, in the field, and usually by, by the by the U.S. Army, uh, interact mostly I, what I can figure out: extraaxial, intraaxial hemorrhages, uh, more like a triage. And uh, for the MEV members, uh, I've invited Mr. Baruch uh, from the Infra Scanner, and uh, Mr. Baruch is now going to just present uh, the data on, on the Infra Scanner uh, for all of us. Thank you. Uh, and again, I, I just sorry, I uh, sorry that I didn't update the title slide. It was presented at a different conference. Um, so first of all, about uh, the group that I'm uh, presenting, uh, representing. It's a collaboration between three universities that develop uh, both the basic technology uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Kind of the lead physician behind this is Dr. Claudia Robertson from Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, she was, uh, I think, a couple of years ago, the president of U.S. Neurotrauma Society and uh, the School of Biomedical Engineering at Drexel University that teamed together to put that to the market. Uh, our focus is traumatic brain injury, and from all the different aspects of traumatic brain injury, we're focusing on the most urgent one, the, the one that developed most rapidly and the one that uh, quick action can actually help most because primary injury if it's happened whatever happened uh, the urgency to treat that of course exists but it's not something that can or there is much that can be done within the first hour usually if somebody survived the time window to treat those things is a little wider and the same thing with swelling that happens slower. Uh, bleeding is really the most urgent thing that develops quickly and needs to be triaged and treated as soon as possible. So uh, the focus uh, that the infra scanner is a handheld tool for detection of brain hematoma. This is not a TBI detector, but we're specifically focusing on detection of brain bleeds. The purpose is to get patient faster to surgery to prevent irreversible brain damage. And the most important thing is together with GCS, it provides superior diagnosis than GCS by itself. So it is, the focus is really to help physician to make better decision. Uh, and the focus here is not to replace a CAT scan, but to save time between uh, injury and surgery. The focus is really time lost is brain lost. Uh, so it is a handheld tool. You can see it's like first-generation cell phones, uh, although most young physicians don't understand what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, if you ever <laughs> used uh, first-generation cell phones in the car, it's about the same size. Um, again, the purpose is to help together with the GCS to get better diagnosis and not to replace a CAT scan. 
Uh, the core technology is using near infrared light, basically the same way that is used in, in, uh, pulse, uh, in pulse oximetry, uh, using the fact that hemoglobin is, uh, uh, have strong absorption in, in near infrared light. And we're using the fact that the brain is symmetrical. There are two halves of the brain. So we're comparing the left and the right side of the head. And if there is a strong asymmetry, it is usually because of membranes. Because of the membranes, when there is brain bleed, it's usually asymmetrical. So what we're really detecting is asymmetry of the brain, and it is usually correlated strongly with brain bleeding. Uh, the detection is superficial, but that's where uh, in traumatic brain injury, since the injury is coming because of external source, usually most of the bleeds are uh, superficial. Uh, so the infrascanner, uh, you can see the display of the system on the screen. It's a very simple system. It's gray, uh, green, red, uh, and the rough location. And the, uh, the accuracy of detection is about 90% specificity and sensitivity. So, and it gives kind of a rough estimate uh, of uh, bleed, whether it's small, medium, or large. And it allows, uh, with repeat scanning, it allows to see progression of the bleed if there is one. Uh, a little bit about history, just quickly. It uh, started as a project with the U.S. Navy, then moved to the U.S. Marine Corps. And from a two-part system, it eventually was ruggedized. Uh, and the system was fielded uh, uh, over a couple of uh, 200 systems were fielded in all U.S. Marines battalion aid stations. Uh, it went through uh, a lot of clinical testing, uh, U.S. and internationally, uh, both uh, civilian and military, but mostly civilian, actually. Uh, so to date, we have over 600 patients with uh, adults uh, with uh, close to 93% sensitivity and about 91% specificity. A uh, similar amount of uh, trials were done in children, which are because they are at high risk of uh, traumatic brain injury, a lot of the focus was uh, uh, of the medical world was on pediatrics. Uh, again, close to 600 uh, kids scanned. Similar sensitivity, the specificity is a little lower than in adults, mainly because uh, uh, kids have substantially higher amount of uh, scalp lacerations, and those usually result in uh, bigger scalp bleeds. So. Uh, when there is scalp bleed, it's usually hard with the infrascanner to detect if somebody has a brain bleed, intracranial brain bleed. So wait, in, can, can you go back? Sure. Do you have sensitive, sensitivity and specificity for those who actually have lacerations at that time? This is this, Your sensitivity and specificity are overall, right? We, we never separate it because part of the protocol is to see if somebody has scalp laceration and the protocol says avoid that area. Okay. So if, for example, the frontal measurement is supposed to be here and there is a scalp laceration here, protocol says move a couple of centimeters away. As long as you are in the same brain quadrant, the measurement will be valid. The point is, with unlike cancer, which is very well localized, brain bleeds because it's liquid, it's usually spread over. And what about, of, and does the same apply for subgaleal hemorrhages or hematomas? Subgaleal or subcutaneous. Sub so, uh, part of our protocol to catch those bleeds is to palpate the skin, to try to palpate the skin to catch those subgaleal bleeds that are not obvious. If it's a kind of head bump and you can see that there is something there, it's clear and it's easier to avoid. the The biggest challenge is usually the the larger uh, subgaleal bleeds that kind of more cover a large area. But to, but it sounds like. If you were to put the scanner over a subgaleal bleed, it would wind up as being positive. Is that, that correct? That is correct. That is absolutely correct. And, and a lot of the discussion later on will touch on this point. Okay. Can I just ask one more question before you move on? Sure. When, when you are giving us sensitivity specificity data here, is that the scanner versus a gold standard, like a CT scan? Yes, or of course. Just... Yes. Okay. 100% of those were done as compared to CT scan. Okay. All those studies, the CT scan was always used as the gold standard. And do you so, have, uh, and, and for, this, for the gold standard, was that following 
New Orleans or Canadian head CT rules? It, or in kids, the PCARN rules or something like that? No, it's usually, if somebody was sent for a CT, he was enrolled in the study I because see. we needed a gold standard. I see. Whether it was, well, there was a justification for that CT or not was not a question that we ever addressed. Got it. Uh, in children, it's usually PCARN. It's mm -hmm. much more used. In adults, it's, in many cases, we discover that it's, there is less uniformity of what kind of rules people use to decide on city scans. Yeah, I mean, there are the two, there's, there's the Canadian and the New Orleans. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that, but uh, yeah, it's different. In many sure. cases, uh, the decision was, well, let's just send it for a city scan. Okay. And there's a, hold on, there's a question in Albany. Sure. No. Is there a question in Albany? It was already asked. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, a little bit about the military application, uh, we talked about that, we did a lot of field evaluation, uh, 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 working with different uh, units. The, the main uh, thing, uh, I think, to mention here was that in field evaluation in Afghanistan, the, the Marines did, during six months deployment, they saved 15 helicopter flights. So, the idea is that... Uh, uh, everyone with TBI was evacuated to a base that had a CT scan and was scanned. Using the infrascanner, if the infrascanner was negative, they, they were evacuated by a vehicle. If it was positive, they were evacuated by a helicopter. So uh, the infrascanner really saved money in, and helped them to make a better decision. It's not necessarily would be the same rationale to use in boxing, but it explained a little bit why the military was so interested because uh, when you're in the field hours away by vehicle from a city scan, the decision-making protocol is different than when you are in the uh, middle of New York and it is 15 minutes to the nearest city scan. Uh, a little bit about use in boxing, and again, where our goal is uh, to focus on time loss, it's brain loss, and helping make better decision. And there are just a couple of cases that where uh, uh, the biggest issue with brain bleeds that in many cases they are silent, and it's very hard in the middle of a fight to say that something is wrong. And uh, uh, there are enough cases of boxer that died. Uh, um, um, not only in Russia, uh, I don't know how many of the doctors here were aware of this, but I'm sure that this uh, story is much more closer to home. Um, so we are, uh, the infrascanner is used, uh, um, an important part that uh, before uh, participating uh, in the event uh, that Dr. Seti invited me some time ago, I, did, I thought that two-minute scan is very fast, but now that I understand that uh, uh, the time that you have with the fighter sometime in the middle of the fight is 15 to 30 seconds, or best-case scenario, one minute, then even two-minute scan is too long. But again, um, uh, I'll talk in a minute about how the infrascanner can be used, but uh, just a fact to realize that the full head scan takes about two minutes. Uh, so we use that, uh, um, a lot of uh, clubs use that for MMA, especially because MMA, there is more severe TBI than in boxing. Uh, we had a, a pretty good adoption in uh, England and in Ireland uh, for use that in uh, boxing. Uh, both the Algerian and Russian Olympic organization, they use that, both of them use that in fights and not in any other sports type. So, and uh, their rationale is also for uh, uh, combat sports. Uh, the protocol that was developed uh, both in the U UK and Russia was uh, uh, scan all athletes before the flight, usually during wa uh, fighter waiting, just one of the examinations to do to make sure that there is nothing uh, abnormal that uh, might say, uh, you know, 
there are sometimes people that have uh, scalp deformities. Since the system is looking at symmetry, in, in extremely rare cases, there might be something inherent that will create a symmetry. So the baseline, how many times are you, are you scanning them multiple areas? Uh, there are eight locations, two frontal, two temporal, two parietal, and two occipital. Okay. So each location is about 10 seconds, so full head scan is, is a little less than two minutes. But why, why do it at baseline? You're looking for... It should be, all of them should be green. Right. But so the baseline is really just to make sure that there isn't something inherent that might mask like some scalp asymmetry. Uh, we've heard, uh, we've seen uh, uh, people that are uh, chronic alcoholics that they have very substantial brain shrinkage, and that brain shrinkage sometimes create asymmetry, inherent asymmetry that you don't see in anyone else. So without hygromas, you're saying? Yes. Okay. So would that be reason enough to stop somebody from fighting? Um... I mean, look, the, the reason I bring this up is I think this is, you know, it's an interesting technology, but in any... Yeah, in, in the field of concussions, there are innumerable new technologies that are always being pitched to us, quite frankly. I mean, I work with collegiate and, and, and even some professional teams, and, and there, there are always technologies that are coming about, and, and I think you always have to say, what's the value added? Uh, does it save time? Does it save money? Does it save lives? Um, and does it actually introduce a false discovery rate, right? So... If somebody is presumably asymptomatic at baseline, they're getting an MRI every three years, your tool is intended to, to, to identify epidural, subdural, intracranial hemorrhages, as well as cutaneous lacerations and, and subgillar hemorrhages, what you may be finding there would be co completely coincidental. I absolutely agreed, and the baseline is more for the measurement during the fight than actually to detect. Absolutely. I see. Absolutely. So, so the infra scanner is definitely. Be, you need a before and after, is what you're saying. For, usually, you don't. In definitely in military environment, you don't need that. For fights, we recommend to use that as just as a baseline to use to make sure that there is there isn't something that we missed just to re reduce the amount of false false alarms. You know, if you don't have time, if uh, it's the middle of a combat, that's one thing, but. If you have time and you have the opportunity, it's better just to scan. Right. And again, this is since this is relatively new technology that is entering, this is our recommendation. It might long term not be needed, but uh, I would def I don't think I would uh, say that there is something inherently wrong with this person, something that needs medical attention and might uh, question whether he should fight or not. So it's not not that you're looking I, for abnormalities. I, I have a um, sure. I would think, you know, our, our medical procedures right now is that if a TBI is suspected in any fashion, we send them, the athlete, to the hospital anyway. A, a two-minute head scan to determine whether we think this guy, you know, has a TBI or not, I, I, don't, I, I don't see how that benefits us. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be contrary. I think it's, a, it's an incredible piece of technology, and, I, you know, I can see where it, it might be of use in some industries. However, for me, saving uh, a trip to the hospital and ambulances is, is absolutely not a selling feature for me. Um, you know, I, I would sooner see the athlete go to the hospital, get the full CT scan, you know, and be sure. Um, and and, and uh, just to be sure, I absolutely agree with that. This is not – the purpose of this device uh, – especially in the New York Athletic Commission specific scenario is not to reduce the number of trips to CAT scan because if you have a suspicion and it is so easy to get a CT scan this is definitely should not be a decision not to send it I think the purpose in your specific scenario the way that I see that it's a simple scan to scan everybody after the fight and because there are silent bleeds that have absolutely zero clinical symptoms and all those stories about fighters that died from brain bleeds, it's not that there were 
uh, physician ringside that did not see that. I think this is what is called continuing reassurance, that your ability to be ringside uh, after the fight, he looks okay, just scan him. Make sure that he's fine. So if I may, I, I kind of uh, uh, say the same point, which uh, Mr. Baruch had come and uh, demonstrated the infrascan scanner. We had invited him to one of our fights, and he, he, he demonstrated the working of the infrascan. scanner. One of the concerns raised by the ringside physicians was uh, false negative. So let's assume you do this, and it's green. Well, you know, so the ringside physicians say right now we're using a clinical assessment to make a call whether the patient needs to go to the ER or not. What if this is false negative and then we get swayed by it? The false positive was not a concern. It's positive, they go to the ER, get a CAT scan. So that's just, that was the feedback from the ringside physicians. If I'm not mistaken uh, to that point, yeah. the, the New Orleans and the Canadian head CT rules have a, have a, um, a specificity of 99%. So less than 1% are missed using that, whereas here you would, you've missed 9.3% with false negatives. So a history is, is, is really our, our best tool still. Uh, history in this case is where he punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> or an, an exa- I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah. examination I mean. Yeah. And these are things like, is there an altered sensorium, GCS? Is there a laceration above the clavicles? Um, you know, are there substances involved? These are the kind of criteria that are, you know, as you know, that are in, in this criteria. I, and I, I share with Nitin's concern of, of, you know, I think it's great for for diagnosing the the, the otherwise missed diagnosis. The, my concern is that it, does it introduce a false sense of reassurance when it's negative? So uh, I think this is important uh, issue with any new medical equipment, and especially a triage tool. Uh, if you use the device incorrectly, uh, you can get to wrong decision. The purpose of the device is it's like anything uh, in medicine, in diagnostic, it's part of a decision tree. If it is, if you have enough basis to believe that somebody needs, you have enough suspicion that he needs a CT scan then saying that the infrascanner in that case was negative, you should not be swayed by that. And uh, the decision tree, like in any medical diagnosis, you have a lot of factors coming in and you have a decision tree. So the decision tree, if you have clinical symptoms, is uh, vomiting, he is uh, not coherent, he is not, uh, his pain response is not okay. If you have those symptoms, you sh- he should get to a CT period. The idea is that by uh, the worst thing that can happen, and, and again, the clinical studies that we had, we analyzed what would happen if you look only on GCS, if you look only on InfraScanner, and if you look at both. And it was clear, just looking at the, uh, the performance of the system, that using both was the best. It doesn't uh, replace neurological examination, it complements. So if you have a conclusion that he needs to go to CT, he should get to a CT. But the, the purpose of this device is really to catch the silent cases, where you, it looks perfectly fine, and you're scanning him, and you detect a bleed. You, uh, first thing you do, it might be scalp laceration, you palpate the skin again, and you repeat the scan. If his skin looks okay, you don't detect any subgallial bleed, and he's still a positive, I would definitely send that fighter to a CT scan, so even me, if he has no clinical so symptoms. Let me ask you a question which is more practical. Right now, as I see it, the infra scan will be used post-fight. Yes. All right. A lot of the logistics of using this during the fight. Let's assume, for want of better, in between the rounds. You understand what I'm, where I'm getting this with, with? Not in every case, but in the case where, well, maybe there's concern raised and in between the round, I don't know how practical this will be. We can talk about the practical aspect of that, but that's one possibility where you do it 
to win the round. Now, the infrascanner measure eight locations, yeah. uh, four pairs. It can measure partial. It can measure only a pair. So if, for example, somebody fell on his head and hit his back, you can scan only the occipital. You can scan the, the areas that you are most concerned. After the fight, you will scan the whole head. Uh, the but more has uh, in your experience, which with the uh, British boxing and Irish boxing, they you go into the protocol, but they don't do it between the rounds, do they? They do not. This is after the fight is over. Right. What is the frequency of a subdural following your boxing match? Um, all I can say the reason why the infrascanner is not used in football is that in football uh, concussions are pretty common brain bleeds are extremely non-common they are much more common in uh, boxing and even more than that they are common in MMA I do not have the statistics I, do, I know MMA that is everybody who gets knocked out goes to the ER to get at least for UFC, that's UFC policy so they're getting a head CT anyways so then you're down to the non, non UFC MMAs and, and boxing matches. And then the question becomes how many of those, you know, how, how many times do you have to scan somebody in order to pick one up? And then how many times do you have to scan somebody to pick one up that wouldn't ordinarily be picked up by clinical history and examination? And, you know, this is, uh, this is technology is definitely for the rare and the deadly cases. And some technologies are entering medicine for those cases. I'm not claiming, you know, brain bleeds generally in TBI are rel relatively rare. They are in the range of 3 to 5% of uh, TBI that have brain bleeds. So, so the all TBI, that includes moderate and severe? Yes. Right. So I think in severe it's something like 20%. Right. Uh, but including all TBIs, it will be something like 3 to 5 It's still relatively rare. But those are the rare cases that you really want to catch because they are deadly. So I don't argue with you that in most cases it might be relevant, but in those that it's relevant and you caught something, it's worth all this story. I would, I would like to bring your attention to your protocol. So the Russian protocol which you say scan all athletes after the fight, if anyone sustains serious hits to the head, KO, then... Do the initial scan, repeat scan, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, one hour, two hours. There's no way we can... Now, do. now this... By that time, we've usually made a decision if the patient has to go to the and, ER and, and again, or not. And again, you have to understand, Russian environment is the fight, unless it is in the center of Moscow, there is no hospital with the city within 15-minute drive. Okay. In many cases, it is in remote locations, and even suburban Moscow, it is at least an hour drive to a hospital with a CT scan. Mm -hmm. So in that case of environment, this protocol makes a lot of sense because they have nothing else. So with this tool, since you can scan them periodically, and especially those delayed bleed that will not appear immediately, if it was a strong hit, even if the initial scan is negative, there is still pretty substantial uh, uh, risk of uh, developing a delayed bleed. So that's what this the pro this protocol is really to catch those delayed bleeds. And again, this is not for New York environment. So what what is the protocol you suggest for New York? Since we have the MAB members, what kind of protocol you suggest? We have we have a level one trauma center for each fight. It's within about five to ten minutes maximum. We have an ambulance. So what exactly would be the protocol you suggest for in our in our case in our scenario? I I would start with using the infrascatter in all scanning everybody post fight. Okay. And for your, I think, kind of peace of mind, even those that are sent to uh, hospital, I would scan them here. So at least you know that if the uh, city were either positive or negative, how it is, how the system works in your environment. And uh, uh, this is more of a kind of for you to feel comfortable with the device, but I think scanning everybody after fight will be the protocol that I would recommend specifically in your environment in New York. Because 
if somebody looks okay, I think it gives you another layer of reassurance to release somebody after a fight. If otherwise he's perfectly fine and you, there is no other medical reason to uh, send him to a uh, hospital. Hey, when, you, when you present your data, what was the false positive rates? Uh, that's the specificity. So okay. it's around the 90%, so about 10%. Got it. Dr. Saying, Gagliardi, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, what do you think um, this would be useful? But, uh, and and ju just to complete that, the more important part is that the negative predictive value was 99%. Mm. So if the infrascanner is negative, there is 99% that there is actually nothing there. Um, I was just thinking of the, um, the situation in Buffalo with uh, Chris, Chris Weidman where there's five minutes permitted mm -hmm. for an accidental or intentional foul. Right. Um, so I know it's not, it prob probably isn't useful between rounds with the right. one minute, but what about the situations where there's right. like five so minutes per minute? Oh, and this, we always call a timeout and do it. Right, but this is more to pick up leads, whereas concussion it's going to be normal, right? I mean, your device is yeah, yeah. going to show Yeah, yeah, this is brain bleeding. So we're concerned about concussion, which is the main head trauma that we see in combat sports. I mean, it, it wouldn't change our clinical, um, you know, decision making. Um, it seems, though, that if nothing else, this if we use this device, it actually causes to send more people out. Because as you're saying, uh, in the case where everything looks fine, if we scan everybody and we do get a positive, where otherwise we would, we might not have had, a, you know, concern or low concern of sending them out. It seems like if we did get a positive in that type of a situation, then that would. Uh, well, why lead not? To us why I still why scan everybody? Why not scan the people who as a so right now. We'll do a neuro exam or a more thorough, we do a neuro exam on everybody. But let's assume, a, a, like I, I presented the red flag, let's assume a fighter comes, he's neurologically stable, but he's had a couple of hits to the head. If he's neurologically stable, we'll reassess him, okay? Otherwise, we'll send him right to the ER. So why are you proposing scanning everybody? Why not limit it to ones who clinically we feel we might, we might be, there might be some neurological Inside. First of all, it's a very simple and low-cost scan to do. So it costs very little to actually do the scan. So yeah, that's why I don't see any downside to scanning everybody. But the concern which was raised by the ringside physicians was that then they, are, they, are, they might be just... Now we all come... You have to understand, ringside physicians come from different uh, clinical backgrounds. They may be neurologists, the Dr. Noble, who's... You know, for them, the near exam is pretty, pretty, pretty solid. You know, that's what they do for a living. They may be orthopedic doctors who never do a near, near exam. They hey. may be. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but listen, I was coming to the MMA. You guys, we, we had like, I tell you, Dr. Kavi was there, and it was like a textbook of orthopedics. We saw every orthopedic injury under the sun. I think I know more orthopedics now than I ever knew. So we really need orthopedic doctors for MMA. But I'm trying to make a point here that doctors come from different training backgrounds. So there might be doctors who are relying more on the infrascanner, scanner, and there are ones who will say, well, I'll use it in the right way which you're saying, which is that it's, it's a complement to my exam rather than... You understand what I'm, what I'm saying, where, where I'm going with this? I, I, and again, I'm pushing against that because uh, there should be. There might be not, but there should be a decision tree of how you make this triage decision. Uh, and if there are enough neurological signs that something is wrong, that patient should go to a CT scan. Uh, if somebody is not sure about his neurological examination and he's swayed by the infrascanner, What do you want me to say? No, I'm not. I don't you know. Really it's a, I'm just you saying know, that's what the concern which was raised. Mammography is 70% accurate. Mm -hmm. It's still used for triage. Uh, the good thing in mammography, usually everybody who is administering the test really understand what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you are in a unique situation that you have different types of physicians that are administering the neurological test. And I understand that, but still... 
I think that uh, as long as it is part of the decision tree, formal decision tree that says in what cases you do what, and I assume you have some kind of a policy of if there are certain symptoms, you sh that patient should go to uh, ER to, for examination. Then it should just jump just mash into that decision yeah. tree. And you raise a good point. And, and, and this is what uh, we're working with the impact test. Right. And uh, the InfoScanner was integrated into the decision tree of the impact uh, at the step two where uh, you do, uh, first of all, you even before you start doing the impact test, you have to check for deadly uh, trauma. So you either send him for a CT scan if you have reason to send him, and if not, as a minimum, you have to uh, to do infra scanner. Right. So I mean, this is this goes back to my fundamental question of you know the the sensitivity and specificity numbers. I just pulled the article that was yeah. that was here. I mean, it's I mean, as you said, it started off with people who had had a head CT for, because they had had head trauma. That's a very different population than just every boxer, right? Um, moreover, the, this sensitivity was closer to sixty percent when considering. Um, uh, intracranial hemorrhages other than subdural and epidural hematomas. That was in the paper. The one that cited here. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess the other question is, what did you find using this protocol? How many people actually had subdurals that were otherwise missed? It looks like you have an active protocol in the UK and Russia. Uh, I, it is not done in the frame of a, I would call it organized study. So it's not that we have data from those studies. Okay. So it's because you're advocating very strongly for us using this, and and I, I just don't see that there's good data backing that it's that it's necessary. You you highlight some very important cases that make us very concerned. You know, that, that these catastrophic you know, injuries. That, the the, that come the, up, the, the reason why the U.S. Marine Corps started and the Office of Naval Research started it is because of the soldier that were called during the Vietnam War the walk and die soldiers. It's those cases that are it's epidural G hematoma GCS 14, 14 15 yeah. that... Yeah, right. no, that's epidural hematoma with, non, with, with blunt force trauma. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's just very different. It's a very different mechanism of injury in, in, in boxing. Then I don't argue with that. You know, my goal was here to uh, present the situation. Um, maybe, uh, and again, talking to ringside physician in UK, I understand that a lot of their fights are also happening not in major urban centers with uh, a hospital with ER 15 minutes away, but also in a little uh, smaller towns and places where the evacuation to a hospital, to a major trauma center, is not a trivial decision. Um, maybe in your situation, the probability of something like that happening is extremely, extremely remote. I don't argue with that. That might be the situation with when you are uh, when you are here and five minutes away, you you have a hospital with ER and any little concern you have, you're just sending him to a CT scan. You know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe in this kind of scenario, uh, that technology will not be as helpful as it is when you are, when the decision to evacuate or not evacuate is a little harder. I mean, what I would like to see, I, mean, I think your protocol that you have here has a good basis in, for, for why it's necessary, but and, and, and having and, some results to bring to us would be ideal. Right? And, and just to give you another thing that I think might support what you're saying, you see the, the map of where we have InfraScanner? And as you can see, the vast majority is in not in U.S. Because when you have such high availability of CAT scans, the need for InfraScanner is lower. The, the issue is that in most cases in the world, you're not five minutes away and you don't have two ambulances that uh, the little concern you have, you're automatically. It's still a risk. And uh, I presented earlier a case in 2013 that even uh, here, a boxer died from a brain bleed. So it still can happen. It's not purely theoretical. Um, the probability is low, but it is still a risk. So I still think it's relevant, but it's absolutely 
your call, as usual, as a physician, how probable that is or not? Well, I, I think it's certainly going to complement your neuroexamination and maybe help in triaging of the fighters. The point which also we have to really discuss is whether the cost of this unit will justify, you know, justify because I believe it's how much does it, how much, how much does it, the unit cost? The least price of the system is twelve thousand mm -hmm. uh, dollars. However, if there are usually when we're working with uh, uh, researchers that are doing study and will publish, we'll later we're giving a very substantial discount on that because we're very interested in. Uh, collect, uh, collect as much as possible publishable data. So Dr. Metzler had to leave, but he sent me an email. He apparently, and he's a neurologist, he apparently suggested whether you will be willing to work with the commission as a part of a study. And you don't have to give me an answer right now, but that is, that's one of our MAB members who kind of suggested whether you'll be a part of a study to look at, you know, uh, uh, along with the commission. And I think that would be a great idea. Definitely from our point of view, because I agree, this is different scenario, different type of injuries that we see in other environments. So from our point of view, instead of doing hand waving, the fact that I believe that this is useful doesn't mean anything. But if we actually will be able to run, and this is my challenge with what is happening in Russia and in UK, there, in their environment it's different than it's here. So if we can have here a study where it will be used consistently and the data will be collected and will be something that will be published, from our point of view, this is of great interest. Okay. Uh, anybody in Albany has any questions, please? I guess I've got a couple of comments. I think it's premature to expect us to implement this without showing us the data from how it's been used in boxing elsewhere. I mean, I agree with Dr. Noble's comments. It's a very different population that you've presented data on. I know you've got hundreds of patients, but they're all in the ER. They're all pre-selected to, um, you know, it's a different population. You're asking us to implement this across the board for all boxers, and you've not presented us with negative predictive values. So we don't know how useful this is. It may not be at all useful. And until you come back to us with data from boxing, from that population, I think it's premature to be talking about discussing how we can help um, implement this, even in a research um, situation. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be um, getting involved in research until we've seen data um, from, from a boxing kind of uh, background and how it's been used here. That, I mean, that, that's an MME. An MME, absolutely. Right. Thank you for coming, now. No problem. And uh, that was kind of an interesting comment. It is too early to participate in research, but you want to see a data of research. How do you expect to get the data from research if you don't do the research? You do the research. <laughs> With whom? <laughs> So, guys, I, I do have another question regarding this. Um, and you had talked a little bit earlier about doing an initial scan, like say at the weigh-in, and then doing um, or or a scan before the fight, and then one after the fight, so you can compare the two to kind of minimize, I guess, you know, who who you would I, I, I'll call it positive. So, I, I guess uh, from a technical standpoint. How much memory does this thing have? Like, how many scans could I do? Uh, that's not a problem. Memory today is cheap. So, uh, device uh, stores, I think, like 5,000 scans. Okay. So, it's uh, really not a problem. Plus, it connects through a USB to a computer, and it's possible to download the data and clear the memory. So, it's really not a problem. Well, I want to thank Mr. Baruch for, for coming down from Philadelphia to present the info scanner. And uh, thank you for a uh, lively uh, discussion and uh, good comments. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And, uh, well, we are coming to our end of our meeting. It's 8 o'clock. Uh, and that was the last item on our agenda. Uh, before we adjourn, I just want to tell you that the next meeting for the MAB is for August 9th. Uh, and if you don't have any, any anything to present to the MAB at that time, we'll just postpone it. But
just mark August 9th in your calendars, please. And uh, is there a motion to adjourn? I believe I need Dr. Nair, Dr. Noble. So we'll, we'll meet again on August 9th. Thank you, everybody, for coming.